Next All right. Awesome. So we've done we've done a few of these now, and um, this week we have um, three kind of let's call it technical deep dives uh, set up, uh, starting with Project Browser, which uh, Chris and Leslie have been uh, you know driving this as the initiative leads, and uh, Project Browser is essentially a key part of um, you know Drupal Starshot. You know, and as we talked about, the idea of Drupal Starshot is to essentially simplify the installation and configuration experience uh, that people have and to make it really easy for people that are new to Drupal and that are site builders um, to get started. And so we imagine uh, Project Browser to be a critical piece of that because Project Browser is how people can discover not only modules, but also uh, recipes. Um, and we'll talk more about recipes uh, later this week as well in much more detail. And so really we need to finish Project Browser. We need to add support for recipes to Project Browser. And then we need to integrate recipes in the installation experience, I would say. And so I have a lot to figure out. Uh, fortunately, Project Browser is something that people have been working on for, a, for some time, you know, uh, Chris and Leslie. Uh, but also others and so we have kind of a head start and uh, yeah just wanted to maybe share that context before handing the floor to chris and leslie as they've prepared some great slides presenter view gotta get the right one here all right making sure just before I go on, it wouldn't be a, a webinar if I didn't make sure that everyone could hear me and see my slides, right? Got a thumbs up from people if we see them. Thank you all. All right. Uh, welcome. We're so glad to, to have you here. Uh, Dries gave a really good, succinct introduction, um, but we're here to talk about Project Browser as it relates to Starshot. And really what we want to do is try to encourage you all to help out. So we want to try and identify those areas where you can help out. But um, before we do that, we'll just do some quick intros. So I'm Chris Wells. Uh, I'm a, a member and the CTO over at Redfin Solutions. And my Drupal org username and kind of my username anywhere else is Chris from Redfin. Uh, same on the Drupal Slack. So if you want to find me in there, that's where Project Browser is fairly active. So you can find me there. And I'll turn it over to Leslie and uh, she'll, she'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to say today. All right. <clears throat> Hi, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Leslie Glenn. I am the manager of customer success here at Redfin Solutions, and my Google.org is uh, Leslie G. So today, what we're going to do is go through an agenda. Um, first, we're going to talk about the history and value of Project Browser. Then Chris is going to do a demo of the, you know, of the current implementation of Project Browser. Uh, then we will share our roadmap for, you know, what we think is uh, the next steps to getting this uh, in for Barcelona, or at least the majority of it in for Barcelona, the MVPs. Um, then we're going to talk about how Project Browser fits into Starshot. We'll give you a quick timeline of when we expect different things, when different uh, pieces need to need to um, happen so that we can, you know, meet that goal of having Reese with those glasses during Barcelona. Um, then. We have, uh, what can you do? So what are some concrete things that you can do starting today or, you know, to sign up for things? And then we'll have Q&A. So it should be a lot of inf good information and, uh, you know, put your questions in Q&A as we go. All right, first section, history and value. Um, so Project Browser was introduced by Dries in the keynote back in 2021 at DrupalCon North America. And the basic, uh, Idea was the project browser makes it easy for site builders to find modules and install them with a click of a button. So thank you, Dries, for for you know the impetus to start this whole initiative. And Chris and I have been fortunate to have been on it since the start. Um, and thank you and Redfin for obviously driving the work. It's easy for me to announce. It's a lot more uh, work to actually make it happen. So yes, thank you. And as an employee of Riff, and thank you also for supporting me and my work. Um, the problem with, with 
what was we were trying to solve was new users, we made it easy to install Drupal. People would install it and then they'd sit there and say, okay, now what? I have you know this blank thing here, what do I do next? So Project Browser was a way to solve that problem. The target audience from the start was site builders and those new to Drupal, which is basically the same as the Starshot uh, target audience. So we've been dealing with that since the start. Um, so this is a real quick look at how Project Browser appears when you, uh, you know, when you use the new browse option, which Chris is going to walk through a demo and give you all the details of this. I'm just giving you really high level here. Um, in the past, users would go to Drupal.org. Uh, they would go to that screen that had I don't know, all kinds of different filters and way to, ways to try and find what they were looking for. And we did a lot of um, research with users and basically the issues with that was they thought they had to fill in every single one of those fields on that search page on Drupal.org. So this is an effort to make it easier for folks who are, you know, who are newer. Um, so now you can browse for these modules right within your website. And again, Chris will be demoing the implementation of this uh, shortly. Uh, the other big thing that, that Dries had in his keynote was to install the module. Or the, currently, it's modules, but the idea was always themes and recipes or use cases, as we used to call them. Install these things with a click of a button. Um, end users, when you mention terminal, you mention composer. I did a lot of training in the blank stairs. We're like, wow, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is going to make it much easier for our target audience to be able to be successful installing and then actually, you know, deciding what they want to um, deploy and implement. Um, there is still some work that we need to do to make the, um, what does it install better and easier. So that's one area that Chris will probably talk about later on. Um, right now, there are some buttons there, but there's more work that needs to, needs to happen. But this basically, downloads and installs the module in one click. It does depend on package manager uh, from automatic updates initiative. So thank you for all the hard work. There was, there's a ton of work to make this actually happen that, that was done by a bunch of other individuals and contributed that to Project Browser. Um, and you know it automatically installs any dependency. So if your module has dependencies, it automatically install those as well. Uh, and then this, like I said, there's still a lot of work to do on this to give notifications to users. They don't understand that this requires this. So there's a lot of work still to do in this area. And we'll talk about that. So one of the first decisions we made, Chris and I, when we took over as initiative leads was to split the initiative into two pieces. So I, I am the leader of the site builder subcommittee. So basically we wanted to look at project browser from a target, a target um, audience perspective, site builders and those new to Drupal. Typically, a lot of things get built and implemented just with the technical, because you know the, the technical people typically are the, are the leaders, and not the only ones, but they're the leaders in getting these things implemented. So we wanted to make sure from the start that we involve the people who are going to be using it so that it would be successful. Um, so we separated, we have a separate group called the Site Builder Subcommittee that's separate from the coder discussions. So that it's you know less fr frustrating for people who are interested in just getting down and getting something done versus I want to figure out how to implement this using you know in the code or PHP or whatever it might be. Uh, we also from the start did a large series of listening sessions. Basically, every DrupalCon, Drupal Camp, every uh, site builder subcommittee meeting we had, we would hold these listening sessions. We were really we were just trying to gather feedback from people. What are you doing now? What would you like to be able to do? And is this working? So we continue those for a long time. We got a real, lot of really good feedback uh, from end users um, on from the target audience. Um, and this also opened up contribution to a lot of people who were definitely, I'm afraid to, to stick my toe in the water and start contributing. This allowed them to contribute you know, a description for a module or a logo, a designer has got to be involved. So really encourage a lot of people in the community that, hey, we can contribute as well. So I think Project Browser really helped in that regard. Um, and of course, making the language accessible to our target audience is always something that we still you know, have to work on. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things that, that I said from the start and that you know, Chris and everybody agreed with the content is, the, is critical to success. What good is it to build this great Project Browser module 
when the information we're sharing in these cards is too technical for our target audience to understand, you know? So from the start, we said, let's see if we can get designers to create logos for at least the top 100 modules. Um, you know, the, the Drupal.org project pages had some logos, but not a lot. We didn't want it just to be all the same. Uh, it does enhance the browser experience. It becomes recognizable to folks. Uh, and then the descriptions, if you've ever looked at the body of a module description on Drupal.org, you'll see that it's, they're all different. There's no, no consistency and it's very technical usually as well. So we had a group of a lot of, lot of contributors that started writing 200 character descriptions that, that will be added to the summary field on the project page. And that'll allow users when they first come to Project Browser to take a quick synopsis of this is, you know, what this module does tells them right away so they know, and then they can decide whether to go further and click on the details. Um, and we also, one of the big things we did was early on when we were doing all those listening sessions, we would ask people, you know, what do you think about these, this category filter? There's 54 categories. And they would look at us and say, I have no idea wh wh which one of these to select. But yet they wanted to select things that they were looking for. I want to look at SEO modules, for instance, and that might have been a category, or some of the other things were not clear. So we spent a lot of time um, in both groups, the site builders plus the, the regular, you know, the, the general group, to come up with a list of 19 categories and, and good descriptions for those 19 categories. So this is all content. It's not code, but it's content that a lot of the community has helped contribute in, and we still have work to do there for folks interested in that. Uh, and there is a maintainer's handbook page that explains all the detail, all the details of the specifics for each one of these three things, logo, short description, and categories. All right. Well, another two other quick things that we did, we researched competitive brow competitor browsers. So we looked at folks that that CMSs and others that have a way to install what they usually call um Extensions, yeah, sorry, lost that word. Um, so we looked at these just to see how they did it, just to get some, you know, we talked to end users, but how are other people, you know, displaying these things to their audience? So we did spend a great time, deal of time on this. And then there was a usability study. Um, Lowry Gabor, some others, you know, set this up. Uh, it basically was conducted by the University of Minnesota. And they basically said, they had some specific things. Can you go find where to browse for modules. Can you figure out the fill? You know, there were specific things they had people do. And we got a lot of really good findings from that. Number one is they had no idea where to go browse, how to get to the browser. Second thing was categories, because of where they were placed at the time on the in the interface, they had no idea they were a filter. They could actually use those, but they wanted something like that. They just didn't understand it was there. So there is an issue there that talks about that usability study. Um, so that's what we've done to date. Uh, one, and obviously, based on what Dries' introduction, uh, Project Browser is one of the core building blocks for Starshot as our recipes, which we called use cases at the beginning because people would say, hey, I want a library. I want to create a library site or I want to create a commerce site or something like that. So there were different, not, not categories, but there are different types of things they wanted to create and that morphed into recipes, which is great. It's a totally different initiative now. Automated updates, I already talked about how that played a huge role in being able to update with a click of a button. I mean, I'm sorry, install with a click of a button and then experience builder is new. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Chris now and he's actually gonna do a demo and show you how it all works. Wonderful, so yeah. All this history that Leslie gave is wonderful information about um, getting to the point where we're at, which is something like this. Okay, and I'm just going to embiggen my screen a little bit, get a little bit of a better desktop -y type experience. So um, the project browser we thought fit most naturally under the extend menu where we currently have um, a place where you can install modules that are already in your site's code base. Um, we've done some work to even pull out a couple of other menu items here that we think will no longer be a recommended way to install like the, uh, the old FTP download uh, mechanism. So I'm just going to shrink this up a little bit. 
You will see a status message here that Project Browser is currently a prototype and the projects may not be up to date with what is on drupal.org. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. So what are we actually looking at here? One thing that's actually kind of neat is that we're actually looking at a Svelte application using the front end JavaScript framework Svelte. And we're looking at a Svelte application that is mounted into an empty div. So fundamentally after this status message, I believe, maybe even before, this whole thing between the header and the footer is a part, you know, progressively decoupled app written in Svelte. And what we're seeing as far as modules is we are seeing only modules that have a release that is compatible with this site. So I'm running the latest 10.3. So the modules that I'm seeing will only have, you know, at least one release that is compatible with 10.3. So if I were pulling up, say, the project browser on a Drupal 9 site today, this list might be a little bit different. And we figured in all of our user research early on, probably the top um, quality indicator of a site is how many people are using it. So our default sort that you can see here in the upper right is most popular. You can change and you can sort by uh, alphabetical um, when we get a really good keyword search working, uh, you'll be able to sort by relevance as well, but the default sort is most popular. We really tried to look at what is, what is a good default set of filters that we wanna uh, project sort of right from the beginning to push the kinds of modules that we want to sort of endorse as a community. Um, and then there's a number of other filters. So you can see that if it's uh, actively maintained or covered by a Drupal security po uh, policy, those are automatically enabled. You can clear those filters here or go back to the recommended filters and you can get more filters here. So you can actually say, uh, I only if it's in an active development status or maybe I don't really care about security advisory coverage, I'm going to just show all. And then, of course, we have this categories filter down the left hand side. You can, if you're quick to count, you can see that they fit on one screen now, and there's only about 19 of them. Uh, and we did uh, got this down from about 55 um, when we started. So we were able to sort of reclassify and re taxonomize modules on Drupal.org. Uh, you might notice that this categories filter is a bit disconnected from the rest of the filters up here, though. So there's currently a, an open issue to resolve that sort of cognitive dissonance in the UI that most filters are here, but one of them is, is down here. So we are working to rectify that. And it's one of the areas I'll talk about for contribution opportunities in a minute. So I was talking also about, you know, this message and not having a great keyword search. And right now that is based on the fact that we are actually periodically sort of scraping drupal.org and loading the modules that are available into the database on the local Drupal site, because we don't have a live Drupal.org endpoint that we can call to get real-time data and say, you know, what is the most popular module today right now? So this is a point in time fixture that we've been using to do development. And we have a commitment from the association with all the projects that they've been working on that we're going to have that with luck by the end of June. So we're a few weeks out from really uh, turning the corner on that. And then we're going to need a lot of help validating the search, you know, making sure that what keyword you type in, are you getting the results that you think are expected? So there'll be some good QA opportunities coming up around that. And then as you look through these modules, you can see on these cards that there are some sort of primary CTA buttons here. And right now that is view commands. So how would I download the token module and how would I install it, right? And some instructions here. And we'll talk about that install with a click of a button. Hey, what happened with install with a click of a button? We'll get there in, in just a minute. The last piece that I do wanna show here is um, you can't tell right now, but we will see in a minute what is being presented here is actually a plugin as far as Drupal is Drupal's code architecture is concerned. So there is a uh, there's a plugin system which will let you register different tabs here 
to search different kinds of things. So why don't I go and show you that? So if we go to configuration and to development and go to project browser, we see that we have the mock Drupal.org endpoint and we have a Drupal core plugin that is currently disabled. So I'll enable that and I'll make it the first tab. If I save my configuration here and go back to the project browser, we'll actually see that I have what I was just looking at, but I also have a tab for what's available in Drupal core right now, and I can install those. You can see, for example, that the categories change based on which plugin you're looking at. So this, this backend uh, pluggable architecture opens up a world of opportunities for uh, adding something like, how about how do we browse recipes? How do we browse themes? Uh, what if I, as an organization, want to provide access to only the 200 approved modules that my you know, college wants to approve? Um, this pluggable architecture really lets people meet a lot of those particular use cases. And all right, I think I talked about all that. So if you were extra savvy, you might have noticed here that we can also turn on um, install via UI, which is experimental. But we cannot do that without a module called Package Manager that comes to us from Automatic Updates. So Automatic Updates was already doing work to interact with Composer and update the code on your site. So we worked with them to extrapolate the Composer command library out into another module called Package Manager. And now we'll see if we go and configure Project Browser, I can allow installing via the UI, kind of neat, which means if I go back and go to my Project Browser, I no longer see View Commands buttons. I now see over here, and I'm going to sort by most popular. Now I see Add and Install, right? So Add and Install means Let's add this to my code base and let's turn it on. Web form, for example, I already have locally in my code base, so I can just install it with a click of a button because it's already here with me. Uh, Path Auto, I don't have, so it might take a little bit longer because it's actually going to now run the composer commands in the background. And the way that Package Manager does this is it actually copies more or less your whole site. It excludes the things that are that are unnecessary, like it is very smart about what it copies over, but it copies it over to a temporary staging area. It runs all the composer commands there, ensures that there's not going to be some kind of weird issue and update, and then it applies it back to your regular code base to say, okay, we have, um, we tested this out, it's not gonna mess up, let's copy it back to your site and install it. And you can actually see now that I have Path Auto installed. So if I look for a uh, pattern, uh, it's not right. Auto. I forget where, oh, URL aliases, right? So now I actually have my patterns tab because Path Auto has been installed completely with the click of a button. I have done uh, nothing outside of this browser to allow Path Auto patterns to be defined on my site now. So that is, in my estimation, a very cool thing. So I do want to point out that to note that this is off by default. So the default is that you could see a browser and you can view commands, but you have to really opt into allowing someone to um, you know, use Composer on the local site. So a lot of questions I get from developers are really, well, how would I actually use this? Would I do this on live? It's like, no, it's configuration. You can use a config split and you can only allow the project browser to be used on your local DDEV sites, for example. However, maybe this is uh, you know, a software as a service hosting solution where Starshot gets installed on you know, some shared hosting or something and you want to get your local outdoor club site up and running and you can apply the events recipe and you can install some of these modules yourself right on live, as long as your hosting will support that. So, you know, it's very Drupal in the way it handles things. You can use config splits to, to manage and do that sort of thing. 
Um, and of course, that it will, like Leslie said earlier, this will install dependent modules. So you might notice that now that I've reloaded, it'll tell me that Path Auto is installed, but Token is also installed because Path Auto installed Token. Problem is we're hiding a little bit of that from the user. I think we're hiding a little bit too much uh, of that from the user. So we'd really like to introduce into the UI a little bit of a confirmation screen to say, here's what we did to your site to keep the user informed. And there's definitely a contribution opportunity around that that can happen. Uh, last thing I'll say is just on this slide, if you go to the project browser page on drupal.org, there is a try it now button here that will spin up the project browser on DrupalPod and Gitpod. So you can open up a browser and you can try it out yourself. Our try it now button enables all of the things that it needs to in order to support installing with one click. There were a few workarounds and things we had to do in DrupalPod, but this will enable that functionality by default. If you use try it now, it's just a little bit uh, cognitive dissonance. If you try it yourself, remember that functionality is typically disabled by default, um, but we, we anticipate that most users will want that functionality. So let's talk about how do we get from where we are today, which is actually a pretty decent place to where we really want to be. So we have identified sort of as far as project browser and core anyway, alpha blockers, beta blockers, and stable blockers, but we've also identified Starshot blockers, things that we really need to make work before we can put project browser into Starshot. And I think it's important to kind of identify that the project browser in a lot of ways doesn't need to be in core to be in Starshot because Starshot will allow contrib modules to, to go in. But, um, Nonetheless, we, we believe that things that are, you know, for example, beta blockers for core are still very important issues. And we would love to get as many of them worked on uh, as we can before really releasing this to a wide audience in Starshot. So we're still talking about, you know, our core beta blockers being something that's, that's pretty critical to advance the, the project. So in terms of alpha blockers, there's really only two issues. Uh, one is that we're not calling a live Drupal endpoint yet. But like I said, the DA has stood up an instance. We're working on rolling out production infrastructure there. I say we, the association's totally doing that. And I just bother Fran from time to time. Um, but that work has already been done to, to sort of swap out that Drupal mock endpoint with the Drupal live endpoint. Um, that work is already there. We just need to roll it in. Um, like I said, we do need to validate search queries and responses as we build out what I believe will be an elastic search backed um, search like power search uh, from drupal.org so we can get those responses uh, via JSON and, and serve what we expect for results. And then really to get into core, we need to switch the build process from roll up to webpack uh, because core uses webpack. That's already also been done and is just kind of waiting. We're staying on roll up for now because it's working and we're going to wait till we get into core for that. So the beta blockers are really the biggest chunk of issues where we need a good amount of help right now in Project Browser. Um, we had a lot of really good success at DrupalCon Portland talking about, you know, trying to get feedback on some of these UX issues. Um, but we need, we need a lot of good expertise and we need we need a lot of good help doing this. So there is CSS and UX and UI work. There is user testing that can be done. We need some work done to make friendly error messages. So on the rare occasion that that package manager has an issue, maybe it was copying something back and someone at your host tripped over the power plug. Maybe uh, the hard drive you know, went bad right at that moment. Maybe there's an error. We need to be able to communicate what went wrong to people in a way that is not very technical. And I think as uh, Leslie and maybe Dries was saying before, Drupal's always been very good at doing really cool technical things. Um, and, and we can see that sometimes when we have an error message that says the staging site had an error you know, are syncing your code back to the production instance. That's that's not super helpful to our target audience. So we need some help. We need some usability people to help with a lot of that front end stuff. So also, if you did watch the product definition webinar, 
And this is track six that Dries was talking about. So there was a number of tracks that he laid out. This is pretty much track six in the install epic is that we need to get Project Browser really ready for this. So I want to take you over to our roadmap issue over here in Drupal core. So we do, we have identified some Starshot blockers, alpha blockers. There's one beta blocker that doesn't have to do with the UI, which is a small PHP thing. But this chunk right here under related to finalizing the UI, we really need to get the UI to be something that we are really proud of and something that we really want to show off and something that we can uh, show to people who are considering other CMSs to say, oh, this is easy to use and I can get an in install a module or apply a recipe like that. So there's a few things that we are sort of undecided about right now and a very, very good contribution opportunity for folks is to help us finalize this UI, either fixing microcopy or um, adjusting the error messages or um, figuring out why we have a content shift, uh, a layout shift, deciding if we want to use iconography or not to represent certain elements. Um, we're doing that now, but it's not necessarily clear what those do. So a really good maybe agency opportunity or team opportunity would be to really pair a front-end developer and a UX or UI designer to go through a lot of these issues and come up with some opinionated solutions about this is what we should be doing. Here's what the research says. Here's the best way to go. And now we have someone who can actually work on the Svelte or the front end or the CSS or the markup to make that happen. So that's a big opportunity uh, for contribution for us. Okay. So where does Project Browser really interface with Starshot? And if you have seen the Dries note or any of these previous presentations uh, or are interested in Starshot, you've probably seen these uh, wireframes or mockups right now. So one opportunity is when we want to install the site and we have to decide, well, what sort of, what is the main tenet of my site? What is the, the primary flavor here? Uh, is it a corporate sort of brochure site? Is it a magazine site that does publishing? Is it a site for a club? So this is really a mini project browser here, which applies high level recipes onto your site. So we need to be able to provide this browsing interface and then allow people to apply. Afterwards, you can get to smaller recipes that are kind of enabling features at a time. So, you know, if I'm a, you know, corporate site, do I want events? Do I want to do form data collection, right? I might turn those on. I might want to do landing pages for advertising. So this is really the prime interface between what we have in Project Browser now and what we need to get Project Browser into Starshop. And it's, it's recipe application and sort of mini browser, right? So we need a recipe browser to be created. Some of that work has already been uh, done using Packagist as a backend. So we were able to just write a project browser source plugin, one of those, those swappable backend plugins. Um, though, you know, that's still TBD. We're not sure if we want to use Packagist or if we should use Drupal.org um, or, or what it is that we want to do. So we want to come to, you know, good community consensus around that before we build it out. But there's a proof of concept here that's been built. It's really useful. But in our MVP, we actually, because we're really just talking about the Starshot installer, we just want to have locally available recipes only. So there is an issue for that. And then there is an issue for this mini browser. So we need to be able to take the project browser that we currently have that kind of occupies a whole page and be able to almost put it just kind of inside a block during the installer. So that's work that has not really um, been undertaken at all yet, is not underway. And so someone who can think about, in a lot of ways, sort of rebuilding, rethinking about the current Svelte app we have and coming up with a mini Svelte app that will apply recipes. So. We have a, a number of issues here that are all kind of related to this mini browser and this project browser source plugin. But that's really what we're talking about is just getting those mini browsers involved. Um, so we, we need in this area, 
more technical architecture backend developers to do the source plugin. Um, you know, the mini browser is a little bit more full stack. So try someone who can put some Svelte together, do some JSON API queries, and then, um, you know, maybe write or edit the project browser source plugin on the PHP side. Now, of course, it doesn't mean we need a full stack developer, but it might be need that we might mean that we need a team of people who represent a sort of full stack of things. And um, this mini browser really is track five from Dries's webinar, um, and the source plugin itself is track seven. So as Dries talked through all the tracks of which there were seven, five, six, and seven are really very heavily related to Project Browser and Starshot and recipe browsing. So later we do intend to provide remote browsing of recipes in the, the sort of non-MVP for Starshot, but that's ultimately the goal is after you've installed the site, you might decide four days later that, oh, I really want a publishing workflow here. So how can I browse and see what kind of publishing workflows are available and apply that recipe to my site? And there is an issue for that one as well. The other thing is that we need a way to install things that are not modules at all. So I talked about this project browser source plugin uh, that adds a tab. Uh, we actually have that one uh, since we originally created the slides and now that issue has largely been fixed. So we do have uh, a recipe browser already in project browser. And there was a lot of work that went into getting project browser out of its paradigm of we install modules and abstracting layers out and things so that we could say we can install and enable anything that Drupal wants us to, that we can use Composer to download and APIs to enable or apply. So we've done a lot of, made a lot of good headway there, but there's still, that's still very much in its infancy and there's a lot of opportunity to make improvements there. We also need logos for recipes. Um, you can see that our browser kind of has Drupal default logos, much like the Drupal core uh, plugin does. Um, but recipes, there's a really good sense of sort of ecosystem baked into recipes. So mod, uh, logos that tie those ecosystems together will end up being really important to kind of know at a visual glance what things uh, go along with each other. And I'll just leave a, a minute up there to see the issue number for um, logos for recipes. Um, which might actually be in the recipes queue. I know Jim is here, um, but you know this is this is a very um, inter-project effort here. So you know we've been working very closely with folks from Automatic Updates and with Recipes to to move on. So that's where we're at right now. And I'll turn it over to Leslie to talk a little bit about. All right. So what do we need to get to between now and a few months from now? <clears throat> okay. So. As you can tell from all this talk and trying to get this done by Barcelona, it's pretty urgent. We need rapid turnaround on these stash block blockers. It's not like, you know, if you feel, you know, if you have time, come help. Well, it's, I shouldn't say that because we are looking for people that just have a little bit of time. But it's something that we really need uh, agencies and folks to, to chime in on now. So the goal is to have an alpha release by DrupalCon Barcelona, which for those of you who do not know, is the end of September, the 24th to 27th. Uh, hopefully, we'll, Dries will be able to show something uh, at the Dries note. Um, that's the goal. So we backtrack that for for what we need to have need to get done. So we're figuring June and July if we can get the UI finalized. So that would include all the UI issues that, that Chris spoke about. Uh, in, in in addition to that, looking at the language and maybe getting some you know looking at what we have currently today because a lot of our listening sessions, a lot of our feedback was early on. And a lot of changes have been made to the interface. So, you know, getting a, getting a little more feedback, making sure we have the terminology correct. For instance, add and install is not too intuitive to somebody that has no idea what Drupal does. We did, I spoke to Chris, we did have that as download and install at one point, which makes more sense, but that was too long. So, you know, things like that where we can get people to weigh in and, you know, what makes the most sense for that type of uh, interface would be great. So that's June and July. Um, not that we can't do things simultaneously, but that's the goal is to have that, you know, finalized by, by the end of July, if we can. Um, July and August, 
you know, our goal was to get the, the recipe stuff, the stuff Chris just talked about. Um, and if there's time, if people have questions, we can actually start to show you some of those issues. But he basically gave you a high level overview of what those issues are. But getting the mini browser solidified would be great if we can get that done by the end of August. And then September, you know, the three weeks that we have there, besides travel and getting ready for all that, any last minute things um, to get done before actually uh, folks go to Barcelona and, um, you know, hopefully the alpha release is ready to go. So that's just a high level timeline of what we're trying, what, you know, we as a community are trying to accomplish to, to help with Starshot. So the big question is, what can you do? There's a lot of folks on the call here. What can you do? Uh, first thing is just join the Project Browser Initiative. You know, you might want to join Recipes and some of the other initiatives as well, but this is information on joining the Project Browser Initiative. Basically, a Drupal Slack is a Project Browser channel, a Project Dash Browser. Uh, and then we have two meetings. I spoke earlier about the Site Builder Subcommittee versus the regular general meeting. You, you're welcome to join both or one or the other. Uh, so on Tuesdays, at 4 p.m. Eastern, which is 8 p.m. UTC, um, we have an asynchronous meeting in Slack, which means there are threads. So we present a series of threads and we have the last thread saying, you know, what else would people like to talk about today? And you can come in any time. The reason we do it asynchronously in Slack is so no matter what time of the day it is for you, um, you can come in. We leave it open for 24 hours. You can just come in, weigh in, add new comments, respond to comments that were made, give your input. This allows everybody to be involved with, um, you know, sharing of information about whatever um, threads are there. So that basically, a lot of people that join that site builders call, which I lead is UX, UI, folks that are new to Drupal. We worked a lot on the content. We work a lot on, you know, feedback, you know, listening to what people think, um, you know, whether it, it resonates with what they're looking for with a project browser. So. That is, again, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, then we have another meeting. Um, it's a more of a general meeting. You know, the content is more technical, what, what is talked about in those threads on the, the second meeting, but that's Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, which is 2 p.m. UTC. Um, again, more technical discussion, but everybody is welcome to join and give their feedback there as well. So we'd love to have people join these calls as we're trying to form, you know, how people can help out here. And then uh, there is a DrupalCon Portland session that we did recently um, on Project Browser. If you're not familiar with it, I'd recommend that you go take a look at this, this link on the YouTube channel. Just watch that. Uh, it gives a lot more detail than maybe we had time to do today. And how can you get your team involved? So here we're talking about teams, whether they're agencies or you know, universities, whatever organizations might want to be involved. Um, as Chris was saying earlier, there are many sets of issues or maybe one issue that needs a, a, a multidiscipline. So having more than one individual from UX gives us different opinions, you know? So we can get teams involved with certain things, that would be great. Um, if there is something that you saw today or that once you go and look at some of you know, our issue cues, you find that you, know, you think is really good that you'd like to work on as a group, reach out to Doreen's and the Starshot team or us, Chris or I, uh, let us know that you're interested in working on something, especially as we said, tracks five, six, and seven from Dries's project definition call on Friday, which if you didn't see that, you know, that would be a good take as well if you spend the time looking at that. Uh, they were in the install epic. Um, so they are currently matching opportunities with interested agencies. So that's what's currently happening. Um, this does require a commitment from your team for approximately, I said seven weeks here, but that's just arbitrary. It's a certain, you know, it's, it's a bigger commitment is what we're looking for. And some of these bigger issues where we need somebody to, you know, actually start it, spend some time and hopefully bring it across the finish line. Yeah. What happens if you're an individual or you're a small team and you want to contribute, you don't have a lot of time, you're looking for something that's less, less time commitment. You can go to this, um, this list of opportunities, we always share this everywhere we go and it's always kept, well, we try to keep it up to date as much as we can, but basically it's a list of opportunities broken down as you can see, you know, there's content, there's front end, there's documentation, feedback, there's, you know, um, 
help with the beta blockers. There's all these different things and you can go in here and it lists all the different, even the try it now stuff's at the bottom there. Um, basically you can go in here, think about how you, you know, what discipline you'd like to contribute. Um, you know, what sex, you know, type of things you'd like to do. You can go in here and say, hey, there's something for me. You're a designer, create logos, documentation, plenty of things to do. So there's something for everybody here. So this is a good starting point, but remember, if you want to do some of the bigger things that Chris talked about, um, you know, reach out and say, you know, we're interested in doing this large piece and we really appreciate both individuals, small teams and large teams helping out because it takes everybody to get this done. Um, you can look at the stable blockers on the roadmap. Chris didn't go over the stable blockers, but there are a bunch of things that aren't, you know, as important necessarily, but they might be things that somebody who's new to contributing, you know, somebody that does code and might be very good at code, but has never contributed. You might want to look at some of those stable blockers, not as much pressure to get those done right away, but it'd be a good start. And then you can move on to some of these other beta blockers, et cetera. And as I said, I've been saying something for everyone. Whatever discipline you're in, whatever you'd like to learn, even just content, um, there are things for you. So basically, start now. Help us out. Help the community out. And help you know folks who are you know evaluating Drupal against other content management systems to come over and, and use this. So that's all we have, and now we're going to open it up to Q and A. And Dries and Gabor, I think you might have been looking at the Q and A. Is there anything you want to call out right away? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Um, you know, thank you not only for driving the initiative, but also preparing the session and, uh, you know, creating slides and grooming issues so that people can get involved. Um, as I mentioned, this is a key building block. This is one of the most important elements to get to the vision of Starshot. And it's great to see that it's that far along at the same time, as you mentioned, there's still quite a bit of work left to be done as well. So I uh, appreciate you um, trying to enable uh, all the people on this call, and then hopefully all the people that will watch uh, the Zoom. Um, a, few, a number of people actually already raised their hands that they want to help you. And uh, I got a number of private messages too, so they're not visible uh, to everyone. But, um, uh, you know, people want to help, which is great. Um, your, your best uh, entry point for that is to um, join the Tuesday or Wednesday meeting. And we'll, you know, if you show up pretty regularly to those, we can help triage and assign uh, issues to you and we can mentor and help you and coach you through them if, if need be as well. Right, and we can we can also direct you to the Starshot leadership team to Dries himself and, you know, for some of the bigger things where they're gonna be, you know, deciding, you know, on teams to do some of those larger things. Perfect. Um, there is a number of questions and uh, maybe, you know, Gabor and I, you know, we can go through them. Um, just do them in chronological order, starting with the Q&A tab, I think. Uh, and Brian asks a question, and the question is, once a module is installed, using the install and uh, enable uh, button, uh, is configuration uh, automatically exported, uh, is a question. That's a good question. It's not currently handled. Um, again, we need to think about who is using this and what is their current situation in terms of a you know a workflow. So if we look at someone on shared hosting running a club website, um, they're probably not exporting config anyway. They very well may be just taking database backups, nightly backups to in order to handle their their config management. For those of us who are not, we are probably using Project Browser in a local workflow, and we're either going to export our config ourselves, or as we like to say, there's a module for that. So there is a module called Config Auto Export written by Jurgen Haas, and I would say that might be a cool addition that really lumps on well to uh, this. But as of now, Project Browser does not handle that for you. Yeah, the, pack right. the package manager component under Project Browser that actually installs modules has a very extensible API. So you can make it like block installing things when certain other conditions happen, or it can export config or, or launch Git, GitLab hooks or whatever you want. Um, so it's really extensible in terms of what, it, what you want it to do as not part of the default implementation, but those are all possible to do. Right. Uh, Michael asks the next question, and it's about uh, Git management. 
And so his question is, will Git management of modules and dependencies with composer files change? So if you install a module to a project browser, whether it's on dev or production, uh, you know, can you still add these modules to Git? Uh, and does it add the modules for those who do composable deployments or is there going to be a different workflow? So I think one thing to consider it, it's almost in the same paradigm with recipes. Recipes is, is more or less just a script that a site builder would do uh, automatically. Project browser behaves a lot the same way. So if I were to run this locally through the UI and it applied and I did a git status, I would see changes to my composer JSON and composer lock. I would need to commit those and push them up through my workflow. Um, again, if I were a developer that was in an advanced workflow like that. Yeah. I think a lot of people also stopped adding contributed modules to their Git repos. Like for me, for example, I just commit my composer JSON and composer.lock files, but not the actual module code to Git. So um, might be worth uh, looking into because in that case, there's really very little to commit um, other than maybe your composer files, you know, a couple of files. Um, Marcelo uh, asks the next question, uh, and he writes, thinking about site builders, when they enable modules uh, using the UI, they would probably like to have an easy way to export the config. Perhaps config pull requests could be handy for this use case, and then he links uh, to the module. So maybe it's maybe not a question, more of a statement. I don't know. <laughs> not sure if you have thoughts, uh, Chris or Leslie. So I, I think this is a two-part question. I'm going to let Chris answer the specific question here, but something I want to bring up quickly was just, we did think about when site builders install modules, how do they know that they need to go add configuration? So we do have an issue for that that's not MVP, but that is something that kind of ties in with this question. Site builders, you know, they need something to direct them to the next step. So let's send them to a place where they can actually you know, decide what they want their config to be. And now I'll let Chris answer the second half of this. Yes. Yeah, dovetailing on that. Like I said, we'd love to have a confirmation screen that that shows the user, here's what I installed, and maybe even one wanting up that. And here's where you go to configure this module. Or, hey, you installed, you know, Google Tag Manager, but you need to give us a container ID. So go here to do that. So we'd love to get people along to the next steps and then figuring out how to export that config. I think it's back to the first question to a large extent, how would you automatically manage the config that has been brought in by this module? And it might be with config PR, which is a module I'm not aware of, but like I said, I also mentioned config auto export um, and things like that. So I think like Gabor said, there's a lot of opportunities for hooks that um, either you could write yourself or it would be a great opportunity to have a contrib module that would handle some of that. Great. Uh, JK asks a question, uh, which is about using Project Browser on live sites or production sites. Um, given that Project Browser uses Composer behind the scene, um, you know, is there an assumption that it would not work on production sites uh, due to, you know, maybe limitations of hosting providers? And if so, then you know, what do we what do we do, and how does it solve the the primary problem of site builders installing the modules. Uh, that is kind of the gist of the question. So I don't know if you can yeah. speak to how well Project Browser is supported on different hosters. Yeah. So uh, I have started looking at some of um, the the sort of big hosts that are out there and seeing what they what they could do. What are the blockers to getting us to actually be able to run? Uh, package manager or run project browser in say a dev instance uh, you know we would need definitely write access to the code so maybe in a live dev type of situation for some of our hosting providers um, but also yeah it we're going to need to be able to work with hosts in order to find mechanisms that allow project browser to work on live or in the hosting environment but also maybe for a lot of us, it's been a long time since we've been in the, I just need a site for my knitting club. And I 
am like kind of technical and I can handle that. And a lot of those cPanel based hosts and shared hosting and GoDaddy type stuff, they have right access to uh, a temp area where the composer stager happens and to the code base as that user. So if you kind of maybe back yourself out uh, to when you were FTPing sites around, um, this, this might actually work on some of the lower cost hosting solutions out of the gate. And so I, I think I, I get this a lot and I just want to remind people of like, who is the audience here? If you're using an advanced technical workflow, Project Browser is just going to help you by not having to type the composer commands, but you're still probably going to be exporting config, committing it, pushing it, letting your CI build it. So you need to you need to think about sort of where in your workflow this is. Um, but again, we will have to work with some of the the big Drupal hosts. We probably will have to work with some of the cheap shared hosts less. Yeah, I imagine if one project browser becomes a part of core, that hosters will pay attention if they're not already and get ready for that change. You know. Um, all right. Another question is from Darren. And Darren asks if there's a plan to show the status of recipes in the project browser, uh, maybe in the same way uh, that the co configuration synchronization page, page does for configuration. This one's a little uh, out of my element. Yeah, Gabor um, said so Gabor work. said he would he would answer it live. I don't know if that was actually volunteering, but I know about recipes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Starshot wants to track the installation status of recipes because we want to show what you've already had installed and what you don't, even though recipes don't natively tr are tracked on our site. But uh, for Project Browser, it would be ideal if we could track if they were installed or not. And so what do you still have available, that kind of thing. So that's still on the table that we need that for the installation step in the dashboard. So we can offer you things that you haven't yet installed but are useful for your use cases, that kind of stuff. And I'm happy to see in the chat that Adam, who did the Project Browser MR for recipes, it already does track the recipe status. So as of right now, it will tell you, probably not in a diff differential way, but it will tell you if, you're, if you've already applied this recipe. Great. There's so there's two questions on multi-module install. Marcelo asked if we need to click each individual button to install, or is it possible to select multiple with checkboxes or something and then install them? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I can answer the first part of this, or probably part of the first part of this, and I'll let Chris get into more technical. But we talked early on uh, about things like ecosystems, which is not MVP. Ecosystem would be the ability to uh, install a whole bunch of modules that are part of, you know, mm -hmm. a certain thing might be co all the commerce related modules. And you, you might be able to go and say, I want to do these 15 different commerce related, you know, pay and, you know, all those different mm -hmm. things. So we talked about that. That's not MVP. Recipes, obviously, is going to allow you to do this. It'll take all of the, you know, the modules that are necessary to install a recipe and install that plus all the configuration. But more technically, I'll let Chris take yeah. it away. <laughs> yeah, we have thought about, we've actually likened the experience of Project Browser to shopping so many times um, that the it, it it's really relevant. And as of now, there's not really add to cart for uh, modules. You can't pick 10 of them and then say, go ahead and apply. Um, that is something that might be possible. And for MVP, we figured let's just go ahead and let one operation happen, let it install its dependent modules, and then you can move on from there. So as of now, I believe it does prevent you from uh, running an install while another install is already happening. Uh, so, the, so that was Greg's question is what happens if you already clicked that and install somewhere and it's running and you click, try to click another one so it doesn't do anything there? Yeah, it, it will. I think it will. It, you know, that's a good point. And part of me wants to just go try it. Uh, it's either going to just simply disable the button or it's going to give you a message that the installer is already busy. Mm -hmm. I think one one thing I would add too is just to put things in perspective, the fact that all of this is built on top of Composer using the package manager is pretty special. And I think 
means that Drupal will have the best project browser and the most security aware project browser in the world. And like these kinds of questions are spot on, but we have the benefit and the beauty that we can leverage all of the power sort of of Composer to manage dependencies and to deal with uh, things that are already installed, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in a way that our competitors don't. So whatever we have or built and will have, I guess, I feel pretty strongly that it will be better and more robust than any of our competitor solutions in the market. Yeah, so that to riff off of that in terms of security, I think we have Fran and Tim Lennon also on the call and they, maybe they can summarize very briefly what the VA is doing for security of project installation and what is the deployment plan for that. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the security side of things and then I'll let Fran speak to the actual infrastructure of Project Browser on our side briefly, because I think that would be useful as well. But, um, and some of you may have heard this before, if you've ever participated in the auto updates meeting, which is also something we're talking about, I believe that's Friday. Um, and, uh, but basically the security team, the Drupal Association, core committers, a lot of people got together at Midwest Drupal Summit in Ann Arbor several years ago to decide, hey, if we're going to allow a Drupal code base to update itself to write to its own code base. It's really got to be secure. And so how are we going to do that? And we looked at a variety of frameworks and we chose the update framework, uh, tough, uh, as it's sometimes called, uh, which is a cloud native computing foundation project to create a specification for supply chain security for automatic updates in general, right? Um, and it's been used in the Python environment. It's been used in a few other deployments. It's been used by folks doing over-the-air updates for like um, electric cars, self-driving cars, that sort of a thing as a security mechanism. And we have implemented that uh, in as both a PHP client uh, with the help of some community contributors, uh, especially some folks on the uh, Acquia Drupal Acceleration team, and then as a server-side um, signing Oracle system uh, with the help of Consensus Enterprises. And we've had it audited actually by two different auditors and all these things. Um, and so basically the packaging system on Drupal.org signs every package that might be exposed to the Composer endpoint uh, so that those signatures are verified by part of Package Manager when it is installing them and ensuring that the software you're getting is the software you actually just intended to get. So that's built in fundamentally at the package manager layer and therefore applies both to auto updates and project browser um, and functions within the way that Composer wants to work and all of those sorts of things. So um, that's how we're handling the sort of security side of both auto updates and project browser. And then Fran can talk a little bit about the infrastructure side of uh, project browser. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I gave an update uh, last week about uh, where we are at um, infrastructure-wise. So as Chris mentioned, most of the work uh, inside Project Browser has been done. We have the plugin created that reads from a JSON um, API endpoint. So now what we are just putting together is the, the reality of that server. So we are having access to the Drupal 7 database. We are running migrations and into a Drupal 10 site. And then we are exposing that data using JSON API first. And then for the search, we are going to be implementing a search API with um, Elasticsearch on it. Uh, Chris did mention the, the end of the month um, deadline for it. Uh, we still think that we are good for it. Uh, we've got the database. We've got the migrations running already. We are going to be working this week on the Elasticsearch uh, side of things. So once we have all these pieces um, connected and working, then we will obviously need to start testing and then promoting the actual uh, plugin that right now is uh, inside a test uh, folder. But yeah, that's pretty much where we're at now. Yay. So let's get back. That's really awesome. Let's get back to it. There's a lot more questions. If somebody still has time, feel free to stay up. Otherwise, we'll post the recording. So uh, the idea of pluggable sources looks very cool, according to Georgie. How do you think 
Can that become a way to implement a separate source of modules other than Drupal.org, like alternative marketplaces that could be really useful for SaaS use cases? Yes, absolutely. And we kind of really wrote it and architected it with that specifically in mind um, around, uh, I work at Redfin, we work a lot in higher ed and we have a lot of people who, you know, would love to empower their site builders to do a little bit more with their site, but they don't want them to just go shopping on Drupal.org and pulling some, you know, module that they think will work, but it actually has a Drupal 7 voice available or something like that. Or So we wanted the ability to sort of, uh, you know, allow list maybe 100 or 200 modules from a, a, a different type of marketplace or something specific to your organization. You know, Redfin kind of is has its own, um, Starshot kind of that we've created with recipes a while back and we have some recipes that we can apply. So we're, you know, just as eager to get recipes, uh, a recipe browser working for us so that we can just very easily say, here's our accordion recipe and here's our uh, whatever else. So I, I think that's, that's to a large extent, the intent. Yeah. Not that we're, we are not trying to sort of bifurcate the, um, you know, where do you get good Drupal modules? We still want that to always be from us and from Drupal.org. But, um, you know, for some of those use cases that that does exist. And we do have a project browser example plugin that is in the code base, which really shows you how to um, adhere to our API to be able to present your own list. So Juan Ignacio asks or says that it would be nice to have screenshots or other type of images explaining what the module does, not just the logo. Mm. That's a good point. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share just a little bit um, because this is uh, absolutely one of our major UI UX uh, points right now is actually that if there is a detail page here where you can look at um, a larger description of what this module does. And this layout is not the layout that we actually want. Um, we want something that matches a little bit closer to drupal.org and reflects the information hierarchy that we think is most important. So this page was actually just plumbed to prove that we could make a detail page, but we have a lot of UI UX work here to do. But one of the most important things we got from our listening sessions was the idea that we need to see screenshots. So uh, we actually intend to show the title, the short description again, which answers in 200 characters, why do I want this module? And then go right into encouraging maintainers to provide screenshots because a picture is worth a thousand words. And of course, those all need to have very good alt attributes on them um, so that that is accessible. But this is something people asked for over and over and over again. So we do intend to actually allow um, and sort of promote visual interest and um, screenshots and, and even uh, probably not a video in this page, but um, in the extra resources, that would be a great place to add some video how-tos and things. Right. So Sorry, have, Leslie. Yep. Sorry, go ahead, Leslie. Go I was ahead. just going to say, so the idea of this detail page that we are in the process of building is to show more information that's on the card, but not to show everything. So for instance, the issue queues and a lot of the more detailed information um, is going to still be on Drupal.org. We will have a link on the detail page to Drupal.org so they can go and get that information. We're bringing what, uh, what the listening sessions and our feedback, what all the users felt was the most important things to help them further make a decision on whether they wanted to use it. But if you want to get into the real technical details, then, then you might go to Drupal.org. At least we'll give you the opportunity to go there. Thanks, Dries. Yeah, my, my question was, um... Is this something people can already help with? It sounds like a lot of descriptions need to be written. Maybe screenshots need to be taken of many modules. Is there things like guidelines uh, for people that want to help with short descriptions or screenshots and a way for them to start contributing them or not yet? There are guidelines for the logo, for mm -hmm. the short description, and for the selection of the categories. We have those. Those are in that... Um, module maintainer link that I gave on one of the slides. Mm -hmm. We have not, there is an issue to, you know, right now the project page on Drupal.org, it's just whatever the uh, person that created that module, whatever format they wanted to use. Um, we do have a, a template that was um, 
brought up that this might be helpful if we have make those more consistent going forward. So we do mm -hmm. have an issue for that. But yeah, actually, the if you create a new project yep. on Drupal.org today, you get that template in the body field, okay. the template that we suggested, but right. retrofitting mm -hmm. to that template. We did not consider in our MVP, but there's a lot of opportunity to say there's no reason you can't take three or four good screenshots of a module and open an issue for a maintainer today and say, I think your images for your project should be these. Um, and I would love for maintainers to start accepting some of those. That would be great. Um, a lot of a lot of things we kind of decided, what is the most important things to throw our effort behind, which we decided those top three logos, descriptions, and categories. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're hoping that the project browser, its prominence will actually encourage maintainers on their own to, oh man, but mine doesn't look as good as this one. I better go in there and update my stuff. So all right, a healthy happens. competition. That's yeah, right. Exactly. So we uh, did the logo short descriptions, and we're in the process of doing the categories for what were the top hundred uh, modules by popularity. Uh, we started on that. We have not gone beyond that, but some folks have actually gone in there and done some things on their own. So there are instructions there. Reach out, come to the site builder subcommittee if you're a maintainer and you want to know, you know, what can you do to make your module, you know, appear, you know, um, with what we have on the card and then what we're going to have on the detail page in a, in a better, more, less technical. Because really, you need the description to be 200 characters, but also not technical so that folks in our target audience can understand them. But yeah, we could use all the help, you know, and maintainers can do that. And for those top 100, we haven't yet given those to the maintainers because we're waiting to get the categories fixed. And we wanted to just give them, you know, them all at the same time versus hitting them several times. So we're close to getting that done. So that a lot of maintainers for the most popular module will be getting a suggested description, a suggested logo, and suggested categories from the community, from people that have contributed. Yeah, and we have so many modules, so we only did the top hundred of yeah. thousands. So 50,000 uh, more to go. Yep. There's a lot more that need, need logos and, and descriptions and categories. And there's, there's nothing stopping anyone from suggesting to a maintainer that they reclassify with such and such a category. And I've added in the chat, a link to uh, our handbook page about, you know, making your module compatible with project browser. Awesome. I also so, want to give a quick shout out to Kristen because, uh, she took action in the meeting, which is pretty awesome. Uh, somebody asked for, um, you know, uh, the question was, you know, will Project Browser work on, on different hosting providers? And Kristen just volunteered to test it or help coordinate the testing, and she created an issue for it. So, Kristen, I'm going to get you some Starshot swag. All right. Still have to make it. We still have to make it, but um, stay tuned. We're going to get you a little gift for that. Thank you. This is the kind of stuff we want to see happen. Good. Uh, I see another question here from Rob Loach while we're talking about logos is very good. So again, on that handbook page, it explains right where you do it. We're actually using logo.png in the root of your project uh, because that's also used by GitLab. So GitLab will mark that logo on your project page inside of uh, git.drupal code, and it will then show up to the left of your title on your drupal.org project page as well. So we're just using the GitLab avatar. All right, there's a couple more. Uh, what if you want to install a different version of something like an alpha beta RC, how do you select the version? Good. Uh, again, we're thinking a lot about um, who is our target audience, and a lot of times they don't they don't know what they need. Uh, so we're trying to make it uh, as easy for them as possible. So what this, what package manager is going to do is it's going to issue the command composer require Drupal slash project name without a constraint. And it's going to let composer uh, figure out what is the best module according to your stability requirements, according to your other things. So um, I think if you want to do something besides that, you will need to maybe tweak your composer to allow it, um, or you might need to issue the composer command yourself. So it's a lot about um, who is the target audience. Makes sense. Um, next uh, bit of a technical question is, how do you deal with sub-modules? So you have a project with five modules in it. The project browser will install and enable probably the main one. And then the other ones, do you find them on the UI somewhere? How do you find them and enable them, install them? 
Yeah, that's also a very good question. And right now, uh, I think I forgot to, to circle back to this, but it's right now we just enabled a module that has the same name as the project, which may not even work. Uh, I remember the Google Analytics project had an underscore, but the module name did not have an underscore. So like that one just won't work. It will, it'll just have an error enabling right now. Um, so we do intend, we, we do want to do some work that will get that a little bit more effective and efficient. Sorry, I'm also plugging in my laptop because I just got the red warning. Uh, so <laughs> slightly distracted. Okay, I'm plugged in, I'm plugged in, we're good. Um, so we do need a little bit of work to just sort of figure out how do we, what is a default install of a module? Um, with that said, um, the th this is what a recipe is to a large extent, right? So we're really jumping out of project browser to recipe browser to a certain extent. So if you're thinking about, well, I want to enable e-commerce right now with project browser, that will enable the commerce dot module, which is the commerce API module, which doesn't get you anything close to a store. Um, we really need recipes, especially as we get into more advanced things, right? Like you can enable search API, but that's not super useful. We really need to lean on recipes to say, here's a usable solar backed search interface. Um, so yeah, we are not handling submodules, and we're, we're going to punt a lot of that over to recipes and by offering recipe browser. All right. And then the almost final question is in the future, do we plan to use semantic search for a project browser possibly driven by a self-hosted LLM? And that's a very cool idea. I'm very into um, RAG and like retrieval augmented generation and trying to find answers to questions. Um, but I can't answer that. I would punt that over to the association to see if there's, you know, any kind of work or thought being given to that. I know that right now we're we're working very hard to get Elasticsearch up and running and have a, a good keyword-based relevance score. But I think it would, yeah, exactly. I think the 1.0 is going to be purely Elastic-based and get all the traditional search and browsing stuff done. I think it would be really interesting for someone to explore extending it with some of those concepts and then seeing if we want to nominate for that inclusion into a, like a 1.1 or a 2.0 star shot or however the, the versioning winds up. But for the moment, um, yeah, I think we're we're going to start with the traditional search for sure. And then there's, I think, two questions on reviews and ratings. So there was a Martin raised that the UI shows modules like token and chaos tools, which are popular, but aren't as relevant for site builders. Um, and do we have plans to filter them? And there was another question from Prashant on reviews and ratings and their role in helping to filter uh, to more more uh, useful modules, more popular modules. So <clears throat> I can answer, I can answer, try to answer this one. Um, early on, this is one of the first things we talked about. Uh, people looked at the stars and said, you know, oh, this one has five stars, this one has four stars. And then we quickly realized, you know, we knew that those really weren't reviewed or rated. Those were just what people, you know, wanted as their favorites. We did talk about, you know, the possibility of rating and reviewing modules. Uh, we decided it was not anything close to what we needed for MVP. It was not something we wanted to focus on. While it has a great value, we decided that most popular would be the default uh, sort criteria with those other ones that we added. And then eventually maybe something like this, we could have some kind of committee or something do these reviews, but it, it's a difficult, um, difficult thing to actually accomplish. And we decided to punt it for now and do it, you know, yeah. later. It would require, it, it wasn't available on Drupal.org day one, so it, it came out of our MVP. It's something that we would have to, you know, think very intentionally about um, to get on Drupal.org if that's something that we, you know, people fought hard for. But, you know, a lot of that is resourcing and governance and making sure that the reviews are honest and not gamed. And it does open a really big can of worms. So we focused on sort of existing quality indicators um, for MVP, but I would encourage anyone who wants to pick up that torch to, to fight that battle uh, in the issue queue. Yeah, I think there's going to be more indicators like the use of projects and recipes and to like help get more data on 
that kind of popularity. And what about filtering a API level modules, internal modules? Oh, yes. The API module filter. Oh, yeah. oh, that's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times what's the most popular thing right now is like token and C tools, right? Which almost no one, I, I can probably count on one hand, somebody who installed C tools and they were a developer who needed it for the module they were developing, right? It's an API only module. It's a developer only module. So we, uh, again, we were working a lot within the existing infrastructure on Drupal.org. We didn't want to make too many radical changes to the fields and the structure of projects on Drupal.org. So we do have a filter, uh, sorry, we do have a category for developer tools. So a lot of times these API modules should be classified with developer tools and that only. Um, we've talked about whether or not developer tools should be sort of not enabled by default in your search, or even better, um, maybe someday allowing a maintainer to sort of opt out of showing in project browser or mark themselves as an API only module as like a Boolean as a way to control that. Again, not in the MVP, but something that is definitely, it, it's come up in our listening sessions of like, well, what does this do? Why do I want this? Because the really most popular ones are these ones that everything else depends on because they're, they provide an API. So it's a current outstanding issue um, that we know we need to deal with and are, and are uh, avoiding like a hairy meatball uh, through the MVP. <laughs> a hairy meatball. Hmm. All right. There's uh, there's one final question that I would like to repeat from the Q&A tab is, uh, can anyone launch this demo Git pod? If you can show again where they can try it out. Yeah, I would love to. People yeah. would enjoy that. One thing that I will, uh, I do want to point out is, wait, this is the whole desktop. It's not my, there it is, right? Browser. So if we go over to the project page, is that, oh, I jump from this one. Let me get back there to get there. So this try it now link, if you click it, it will just open to gitpod.io. What you're seeing with me here is I already have an account on gitpod.io. So for me, I can hit continue and in about four minutes, I'll have a site where I can actually run project browser, click add and install, and all of that will work. It does take a few minutes to like pull the container images. It's using DDEV behind the scenes. So it does take a minute. Um, and one of the weird idiosyncrasies of it is at some point you need to click inside this terminal window to get it to open the browser for you. The real weird part is that the first time you click this, if you do not have a gitpod.io account, you are going to need to get a gitpod.io account. It's going to ask you, do you want to create a gitpod.io account from GitHub or from GitLab or from maybe Atlassian or Bitbucket? I'm not sure. There's three there. And so you need to sort of go through this rigmarole to create an account first. But the, after that, once you have an account and are signed in, it's pretty easy to just click Try it now and be able to spin up that demo. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to make you watch through that whole thing. It'll show up in the top right there. This code, now that everything else here, show us up in the top right. There's a way to expand it to be full screen and away you go. Yeah. All right. Green button right on the project page. Thank you. So people can find you in the project browser channel on Slack and all the issues that we posted. I Lots of great issues to get involved in. I would say also for people that may have never contributed, I do feel like there's a lot of sort of uh, starting issues that people can take their first steps um, in with. Um, and then obviously there's some pretty advanced issues for those that have uh, maybe more experience contributing uh, to Drupal. Uh, so a little bit for everything. And uh, yeah, we'd love to see people get involved and you know, get this one over the finish line. Game changer, I think. Very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have a big impact on Drupal. Absolutely. So. Right, awesome. Great. Thanks, everyone, for yep. the opportunity. Yep, thanks. Yeah. For you're thanks. Welcome. We Bye, have everyone. another one tomorrow. So tune in again tomorrow, and you'll keep learning about all of the different pieces of Starshot and how they all fit together as well. So thank See you all. You. All right, thanks.
Bye. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.